Hello, this is Hawk Devine, and today we are going to finish SCP-6500 for real this time. We are going to go to the e e vote again, and this time we're going to choose something different. Let's get right into this. As I'm sure you remember from the last video, we had to make a decision, a tie-breaking decision. This time, the decision is nay. Last time we said yes. Motion fails. We are the lock. We are the key. A world secure cannot be free. Contain and do not bend. Protect until the end. We will not fade. And so, opens this. Proposal, 6500 Omega, denied. Following O5 Council Conference, X2737B, the Temporal Anomalies Department alerted administrative personnel to the passing of a critical pivot in time. It is believed this occurred uh, as a direct result of the conference's events. We already know what a pivot in time is. Grow pivots can only be detected after they occur. Due to immense ramifications posed by the wrong outcome of critical pivot, the temporal anomalies department is tasked with, the, with monitoring the stability of creating of newly created branches. This entails observing the actions of individual foundation personnel following the critical of pivot. Detailed reports of such are to be appended to this document, presented in keeping with the Protocol 6 Sun in case of lingering SCP-6500 effect. We have the Path of the Warlock, and the Path of the Requarians. Journey to the afterlife of Corbanic and the city of Alagada. Save the living and the dead. Discover yourself and face the Hanged King. Uncover hidden... No well, I guess we're going to the Warlock first. <sighs> After life and death, the great desert. She woke us from a deep sleep, perhaps a nightmare. Her breathing was fast and labored. She was on her back, but her, her lungs were ragged and her muscles ached as though she'd been running. The wind teased her hair and the sand beneath her lap coat was... Wind? Her quarters at Site 43 were fully one kilometer beneath the ground, yet a breeze rolled over her naked torso like a blanket. Lab coat? She was definitely wearing her lab coat and absolutely nothing else. She could feel the seams against her shoulder blades, pressing into the sand? Udo Okori opened her eyes. The first thing she saw was the moon. It was far too big, so she stopped looking at it. The second thing she saw was her body. It was indeed naked, so she closed the lab coat over it and said, Are you doing up the buttons? The third thing she saw was a second moon, also far too big, and the, present, and the process of confirming that there were, in fact, two moons in the sky, the pale green sky, she accidentally saw a fourth thing, the third moon, and was forced to take the ology uncomfortable truth. She sat up in a measureless, undifferentiated plain of orange desert. Just in time to see a sooty cloud dissipate on the horizon. She felt a pang in her heart, and she didn't know why. She only knew what she had brought that thing with her. Here to... Corbanic. Her voice was surprisingly calm and clear. I'm dead? Let's put a pin in that. She reached into her breast pocket out of habit and was surprised to find her coke bottle or glasses there. She put them on and winced. There was something wrong with the lenses. She tapped them and winced at the door response. Plastic. Oh dear. She clambered to her unshod feet. A rhythmic clam in, in greeting her as she turned to see what else. A kangaroo loafing toward her. Oh, she said. She knew what this was. She'd read the low clearance parts of the operation Gal had those year a few years back. It was called a flame bearer, and she wasn't sure if there was more t than one of them. They didn't live in the Great Desert, though. Where? It was getting close. She took a, a step a back and took a giant leap forward as if to 
demonstrate the futility of the of this gesture. It peered down on her with with judgmental black eyes, then reached into its pouch with one clawed paw. She saw the paw clench into an almost fist and reach for her own pouch, the regents on her on her belt, before a complete lack of pants caught up with her. The kangaroo withdrew its paw, held it in between them, and opened it. It was empty. Huh, that's a pretty neat picture. The flame bearer stared morosely at its own empty pad for a few moments, glared accusingly at her, then turned and loved away. Okay, she said. Lacking any particular reason not to, she followed it. Any change? Although FMC at Area 08 was presently monitoring over 1,000 extraterrestrial objects, Director Richard Barnard didn't need to specify which one he meant. He stated at, at every duty day with the same in question. No, sir, the lead ground controller gestured vaguely at, his, at the big board. 179 is still pointing directly at the Earth. Bernard Art frowned. The restoration of anomalous equilibrium had brought the self styled lookout out of her ethical position more than a week ago. Oh. And she had immediately aimed one long finger at humanity's pale blue dot. This had an initially occasion of debate about what the threat she might be detecting. But that was over now. She was pointing at the foundation. Everybody knew. They had caused the impasse, but nobody knew how everybody knew. They also knew that the L5 Council had taken a vote on what to do about it. Until that vote passed, all anomalous life in the universe was potentially at risk. The vote had been six days ago, and yet... Sosu was still pointing. Should we ask her what's up? The controller suggested. Bernard considered it. After call sight, a loud beat from the co control council cut him off. Sorry, sir, we're getting a new contact. Oh, of course. It's 2578D. Bernard nodded. SCP 2578D was a horseshoe crab in Earth's orbit, a bizarre leaf shaped drone spacecraft belonging to Corbett X Militant Three Moons Initiative. They used it to lace holes in, in fascist dictators. It appeared during the impasse either fling through the menstrual aperture on the dark side of the moon, or as acting some sort of cloaking mechanism. The latter now seemed much more likely. What's it doing? Uh... It's con the controller blanked. Pointing at Stinger at Site-01. Okay, but now I'd learn it again. Well, I was already going to say, let's call... Second beep, this one more insistent. Getting a message from them, the controller reported. 2578D, not Site 01. Well, let's see it. While he waited for the e printer, Bernard examined the big board more carefully. He saw what he expected to see, sighed heavily, and massaged his temples. Here you go, sir. Foundation. You will allow me to congratulate you on the successful resolution of the recent pan-multiversal crisis, which you alone precipitated. Precipitated. I believe I speak for all other affected parties when I say we're sure you did the right thing for you yourselves personally. On the back of this triumph, I am pleased to offer you a second opportunity or obligation to clean up a mess of your own making. Whilst we'll engaged in unlikely superheroics, agents of your organization have deposited one warlock and one out of the abomination within the temporal, temporarily immortal bounds of the multi sovereign and planes of Corbanic. I would like to ask you to kindly remove them at your earliest convenience, but will instead ask you harshly do the thing but fast, or we will laser literally all of you. If you can't get them both, the other abomination is basically 99% of the issue here. We have enough of those already, and we like ours much better. You are watched, you are protected, you are in deep shit, my son. Gerard Nyong, President. 
Don't make us fourth moon you permanently initiative. P.S. Literally all of you refer to the foundation of the O5 Council, not what you erroneously, you erroneously think as of as the entire human race. We're not that variety of monsters. You saw the O5 Council, right? Are there still 12 of you? We've heard, heard rumors of a 13th. And maybe even a 14th, 0th. Why you've never returned our mailers? Well, said Bernard, that makes sense. Now let's cut all side 01. SP-179 was pointing directly at the 3 meter metal crustacean hanging over their heads like the sword of, of, of the uncles. It's nice to know she cares, he mused. The Great Desert. The chilled sand insinuated itself between Inudo's surrows as she paced the endless desert. All sense of time are irretrievably lost. Probenic was an afterlife. You were supposed to have to die to get there. She couldn't remember having died, yet here she was. You were also supposed to arrive there bare as the day you'd been born. Yet, some well, yet she somehow kept her lab coat and a general gist of her eyewear. The lenses even seemed to be focusing. She wondered if they'd sound like glass now. What did it all mean? It means Corbenic is affected by the impasse. That wasn't really news. All contact between the lands of the living and the dead had abruptly ceased months ago. The flame bearer looked back at her occasionally, not when it saw she was still there. That made her feel a little better about her decision to follow it. If only a little. She knew that they were moving in the direction of this strange black cloud she'd seen on awakening. And wondered what the connection was. A faint starry light shone on in the peace oop sky. Beneath the cluster of moons, they're moving toward that as well. Been a hell of an interdimensional puff cross you use. From Koyakori to the Wanderer's Love Library to. Oh no. Oh no, oh no. She remembered it all in a rush of terrible understanding. Her flight through the palace of Alagata, the billowing in, in bellowing in shade in pursuit, knowing she'd save her friends, but doomed herself, her war it's failing, flinging the last of her power behind her at the encroaching black, seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. She closed her eyes tight. I brought the hanged king to Corbenic. She opened her eyes just in time to avoid running into the kangaroo. He was looking down her with an expression of intense concentration. Its huge brown eyes squinting, its jaw set, paws clenched, its shattered in place, and she took a step of just before its head burst into briefly into brilliant flame. Behind, said a voice in her head as the fire went out and the kangaroo staggered to its knees, panting heavily. She didn't want to look. Face the facts. A second voice clanked to her mind like bells bear. Like ball bearings in a blender. Look upon your truth and accept it. She turned around. Miles away, a striking figure was backgrowned by the aliens in the sky. It was swallowed in an immaculate white cloak, which blew in a, a stronger wind than she could feel. I was approaching with slow, deliberate tread. She felt certain she could outrun it, and yet certain it wouldn't matter. Delay, 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 it droned. I can wait. I am the end, and the end is inevitable. She forced herself to look away. The kangaroo gave her a sympathetic glance and bowed off again. With a sense of renewed urgency, she headed on after it. Site 19 Chief Delphina Ivanez offered to lead from the front, where her mobile task forces went. So, oh, did she. That meant she split her time between Site 43 and various hotspots in Canada and the United States. Which, in turn, meant she spent virtually no time at other Foundation facilities. She, therefore, hadn't been there in years, hadn't been here in years, and, they were, and there were changes on every scale. Obvious lines in the sun, other broken god, Gerberus, had torn up the old grass. Obvious rebuilding where the chaos and certainty had flattened the exterior walls. Obvious shutters on, in, on one entire wing. Shut down in the wake of the mass die off. Side 19 had suffered the 1 2 punch of the Foundation Elimination Coalition last October. 
and the horrors of the impasse, and like everywhere else, it had been profoundly changed. There was even fresh gravel on the path that on the helipad. Hmm, maybe not so fresh. Some of the grains still carry traces. It's a black or red spray paint. Reduce, reuse, recycle. The director's office was spartan and tidy, as was the director herself. So the moose had an organized, or had an organized mind, so this meeting would be formal, but no a mere formality. What are you going to Alagada? The words were out before Avinas even sat down. She took the opportunity to collect her thoughts. I don't like Italian food. Moose blinked and, and pursed her lips. Avinas shrugged. Uh, Olive Garden, Jake? Moose flicked a file on her desk with neatly clipped fingernail. You're going to leave Yvonne to Site 91, where you'll tell Dr. Okori's parents what happened to her. Then, when you think nobody's looking, you're going to go AWOL at the Tower of London. There seemed little point in lying. I don't think I put that secondary part in my itinerary. The other woman smiled tightly. You lost a friend and it never meant. You're going to get her back. It doesn't matter what you say your leave is for. It's in her nature to play the hero. Even as a moment passed, a similar consideration before responding. I spent a month fixing this mess. I'm not playing at anything. This side. Poor Charlie Ace of Roots. That was bullshit. Moose always chose carefully. You wanted to see how I'd respond. I'm not trying to scuttle your plans, even as, in fact, with how impetuous you are, I'm probably doing you a favor by calling your half baked notions plans. She raised an eyebrow. Instead, I have a few, shall we say, Suggestions to make. The Great Desert. There was no sleep in the land of death and dreams. There was no night because there was no day, so Udo could have been walking for weeks for all she knew. She didn't need to eat, she didn't need to drink, and she didn't need to stop and rest. All she needed to do was move, head for whatever destination the flame bearer had in mind, and keep ahead of her pursuer. Alternatively, you could stand and face me. She stole a glance back at it. It wasn't gaining ground, but neither was it falling behind. As if in response to her attentions, the tone's voice came again. All things must pass. All motion must cease. You are but an interval. She faced forward again, her heart left to her throat. Dad? The kangaroo had halted its progress, but continued to stare at the peculiar light, point of light on the horizon, and the the aftermath is hate low forming granted. Dr. Obi Okori was standing between them, a barrel chested and slightly overweight, a, a healthy dark skin, and a neatly trend and ripe beard. He was, was ankle deep in the sand, completely nude, looking at her with a mirthful mask over her eyes filled with sorrow. She stepped forward, relief and terror fighting for control. Dad? How? Why? She peered into his dark eyes and kept talking to him and from answering. How are you here? Please tell me you aren't. Please tell me you didn't. He reached out to take her hands. Smiling reassuringly, he did not himself seem reassured. I'm fine. Good diet, lots of exercise, regular checkups with the site physician. Your brother wouldn't have it any other way. Relief. Then she marked the transition with the flow of shameless tears. Then how are you in Corbenic and why? He pointed over his shoulder. Walk and talk, Wonderkind. That is a really neat word. She didn't and looked this time, but not. It had to have gotten closer. And closer and closer and closer and... Then she stopped moving. The kangaroo resumed the tops, and they fell in behind it. 
I came to pass on a message. Obi's face was grim and determined. Delfina Ibanez visited us yesterday. She's coming to collect you. Yudo laughed and wiped the tears away with her black coat's Let's lead. Of course she is. Hero. Obi placed a supportive hand on her shoulder. You both are, and that's damn lucky. Something followed you here. He sighed. Two things followed you here, and they absolutely cannot stay. This was something of a diplomatic like, incident between us and Corbenic because of it. She cringed. How bad, but what can I do? I've got no regents, and anyway, I'm no match for it. Nobody is a match for it. He squeezed her earth's shoulders slightly. If there's one thing you are, Udo, it's a match. These bastards clad up on loud on up around you, you burned them clean away. Damn, this is really hard to read. Crow's crest. Even as stepped across the threshold and the world fell apart. A different world fell together in its place, and she shouted at the profoundity of the change. She was sitting on the, on the grass as, as blasted hill. Oh, look. Back against a gnarled and twisted thing, gazing at the at a turbulent sky of charcoal gray and pus yellow through a pure air of almond eye holes. A vulgar metropolis of black and gold spread across the plain below, floating the dead oil tight like a scab on the skin. An ocean of opaque jet surrounding it. There were whispers on the wind, and the wind was gentle. She smelled burning roses and boiling blood. A voice of tr of dripping triacle song. I drawn this elemental potion unmixed into an oil black ocean. Where'd you steal that from? She asked, taking in her feet. I'm paraphrasing. Learn the difference. She took her feet and removed her mask. So far, so good. It wasn't supposed to be possible to do that, which meant the magic hand wholly returned to Elagata. She turned the thing over in her hand and scowled out when she saw what it was. Charming. She frees me the tragedy mat as sideways down the hill and watched it pinwheel along the dusty rocks. Hell world has a sense of humor. She reached down to check her service weapon and cried out in a sudden ecstasy. What the fuck? Her garden was still door air, holstered in a fine black satin pouch. She bare but she very much knows it. She was wholly preoccupied with the un with the incomparable silky smoothness of whatever she appeared to be wearing now. She shuddered with un involuntary pleasure just rolling it be between her, her fingertips. She didn't like wearing dresses. And not for some cliche tomboyish reasons. She preferred to attract attention with her actions alone. This particular address was sure to occasion some comment. A high neckline and a low split hem. Shimmering saffron and glittering gold, catching so much light that it had to be somehow luminescent in itself. She stretched and felt the familiar pull of a rayon jumpsuit she knew of the rayon jumpsuit she knew she was actually wearing. Stringing the fabric again, and once more endured the rush of tactile delectation. She suddenly understood what was so dangerous about Alagata. Judge not, lest ye be judged, a throaty cackle. <laughs> Especially here, at the judging place. The Kevlar backpack she had been assigned to 19 was now a lovely red line and bag with silver. A, a brocade and one strap over her bare but not actually bare at all red shoulder. She lifted the flap and examined the contents, sighing with relief that when everything checked out. She felt edgy all over and she didn't know how to scratch it and worried her how much she wanted to. That's the thing people don't understand and about corruption. Not all rot savor sour. Something loomed up behind her and she felt an inarticulate urge to behold it. He learned as much to his sorrow and hours. She waited just a moment to assert her own three will, free will, then turned around. What brutal east beneath this tree was strange by sudden gravity. It was indeed a tree, or once had been. It was blackened and bent into a torturous corkscrew of broken bark, or I could eeping yellow sap, leafless and plastered with wreaths as, as nasty white thorns. A long red and a rusted chain hung from the broadest branch. 
resolutely following Erling to sway into Elen in the wind. The key to the city's face, the voice mused, and the key to the city's gate. Even as pursed lips, speaking literally, they get into the dead earth where you arrived. The smarmy tone took on a lecherous tinge. You left behind quite the impression, as I imagine you often do. She bit back a retort, if only because she could in fact see the disturbed ground where she'd been in sitting moments prior. She worked her right boot in an sort of short soil. She saw a dull glint. Dipped her toe beneath the offending object and kicked it into the air. Nice catch. Lousy hiding in place. She brushed her he, he dart from the black flecked key and wrinkled her nose. It stank like a septic wound. The people shun this place, the voice explained. It chuckled deep and low. <laughs> Most of them. The hairs on her neck torqued up and she followed their example. The tree was now filled, crown to trunk, with a mer Order of black eyed crows. They glared silently, baffling down her as she carefully descended the crumbling hill. The Galate Waste. The endless desert had finally ended, the landscape trading against dark sanity for something in Wilder. They were now out trekking across a, a glimmering sea of gel, an expanse of tiny turquoise as balls which squirmed beneath their cautious tread. The once interminable march had become miserable, almost pleasurable in the company of Udo's father. His plan was lunacy, and she started her to imagine how she might set in motion. At least it didn't take long to outline. They had plenty of time for less stressful conversation, for catching up, for avoiding the elephant in the room. She shot her diligent stalker dirty look. It was a brave thing you did, Obi was saying, to draw the, the hanged key ing away from your friend. Perhaps the bravest thing I've ever heard of anyone doing. His obvious pride was warmth in the chilly waste. She magic. She shrugged. Without magic, I die. If they hadn't made home, they wouldn't, there wouldn't have been any more magic. Pretty simple math, so I don't... pause. The only vocally, then shook her head. No, actually, you know what? Fuck it. I was brave. Obi laughed. Do you know why it worked? She opened her mouth to respond and found she didn't have a response. She shook her head. He knows, and I know, and you too will know in time. The past is dead. The present is dying. So release them. Embrace your empty future. She waved dismissively at the specter. I don't like this guy. Obi ignored her. He was barely trying to hold on to his smile, invisibly failing. The hanged king should have been attracted to the sword. The ambassador was. It was its a potent source of power. It was the only font of magic in Alagada. And sure pulled him, him like a matu of flame. Yet he followed you. She glanced sideways at him. This feels like an oncoming train. A revelation. He then left the sign. I'm in train. She finished miserably. You pause and forever indicate as inconsistent things do. Her father heard the voice. He gave no sign. The direct road is always best. To run swift and sure. There was a pit in Udo's stomach, and the voice in her head had nothing to do with it. Come on, Dad, spit it out. Spit it out. OD exhaled and exhaled in obvious frustration. A moth to the flame, he repeated. Perhaps, he sensed a brighter. The gelatin in front of them shifted suddenly, and the pl flame bearer halted. I shot them a meaningful look, then rested back on its haunches.
Hey! Udo waved a hand in front of his mouth. It's where we get off? She looked behind her at the at the white lord of Alagada. She could see the contours of the, the Abbas or, or tragedy mask. Asked. Its eyes were mere slits of concentration. Its mouth a cruel scar. You didn't need to wait for me, it crowed tunelessly. I'm nothing if not patient. The kangaroo snapped its teeth at her as it slowly sank into the moonlit at muck. It squinted, it clenched its paws, it yelped in pain. She staggered toward Arta, pulling her father along, digging in her pockets for the sand which had accrued there in, the sl in her slumber. She drew out a handful, let it trickle between her fingers. It's not been her urine, but it might just do the trick. Her father brushed it away. You don't need that. What? You don't need regents. Make the motion, center the energy, call down the magic. Forget the sand. Don't think, just do it. The white shape in the distance was now not so distant at all. She traced the triangle in the air. Did the blowing sand and really followed the path of her finger and pressed her hands to the flame bearer's snout. She closed her eyes and she spoke the words. She focused and brilliant light snapped her right eyes back open. Kangaroo's head was ablaze and ripped back to shout to the heavens. Arise! O oh Lord Beneath! The jail rose up around it and it was gone. The waves were shifting madly. Teal dunes barreling back and forth like a sound of a leviathan gurgling listerine. Walls of jelly smashing against her legs and breaking around them. Udo fell to her knees in the wobbly gunk, and as a blue-green horizon reared up over the White Lord, she felt her eyes locked to this black space where its own eyes should have been. A minor setback, geologically speaking. The wave crashed over it. Something exploded behind her. A hall of gluttonous aquamarine ever the back of her lap cup, or pinged off the back of her head. Oh, said her father in a very small voice. Well, that's something. Against all reason. She rolled back over to see what it was. The Gate of Traitors in Alagada. If I walk through here, won't I get a turf back to London? Isn't that how doors work in Alagada? Only closed doors. Gates don't count. Gates are special. There were no guards and there was no portcullis where the beaten the cart art paths met the endless limits of the Black City. Even as found only two unadorned columns of flesh pig egg iron bars set deep into towering walls of tourmaline. The lock was far, far larger than the key, and she felt positively idiotic sticking it in and there. Her hands shook, and the clank of metal on metal felt like mocking laughter. Only for a moment she doubted everything. The merest of mortals. Before the pervasive wrongness of Alagada got overwhelmed her, and she turned the thing in the empty air with a loud, defiant fuck it. The key vibrated in her hand, and she backed away, dropping it into her satchel as the gate swung open row by row. A pair of hands spread wide, beckoning her to enter. Home, sweet home, the voice purred. Jesus Christ, she breathed. She had expected the aspires of burnished ink-dark stone flecked with gold and limp black banners woven with symbols she couldn't read and colors she couldn't identify. The hint of a tune that was fascinatingly foreign and intimately familiar and maddeningly elusive. The way the walls and cobbles pulled away from her like the background in a dolly. He zoomed shot. The older of rot and vigor. She expected the ma ass masquerade, but she did, had not expected the massacre. They were everywhere. The porcelain veiled Algodans. 
laying prostrate in the street, stumped over in shadow arcades, face down in reflectionless reflecting pools, or simply sitting down, breathing low, holding their masks to their face, faces like they need to, them to breathe. The living are lost, and death comes from the dead. What's wrong? I can hear your thoughts, you know, the voice chided. And others can't hear me. Do you wish them to think you mad? She shrugged. A little madness goes a long way to blending in with an alagada. The voice rolled its unseen eyes. There is madness, and then there is foolishness. She picked her way through the mass of uh, twisting bodies, suddenly wishing she'd kept her own mask. Every face she faced turned away. Every mask was wet with tears or blood or vomit. Every pair of eyes was haunted or rimmed with red. What is wrong with them? Nothing which has not always been so. The glamour is fading. The scales are falling from their eyes, and they are laid bare before themselves. She passed two naked bodies propped against each other in an open doorway. They were loosely embracing and moaning, but looking away from each other with obvious shame and disgust. Alagada is peopled with the memory of of people. The space is left behind. What, what makes a man a man is dead. You remain, which remain. If you like the rest of the curses, they are nothing at all. She swept across the avenue, head swimming, wishing she was wearing something that didn't weep by default. She had almost identified the music in the air when it fully shifted to something from unfamiliar. The curses? The first curse was magic, the voice spat. The curse which binds us all. The second curse is theirs alone. The reward they reap for, the righteous treason. Deeper in the city, she passed the occasional ambulatory elegaden to man, woman, other, where they were holding their masks to their faces and whimpering softly, like in a raptured audience with opera glasses. Why are the masks so important? Masks are protection, the a voice was flat and direct, for ourselves and for others. They don't want to know what they look like. They don't want you to know. That cruel chuckling again. Perhaps they're afraid there's nothing left to look at. <laughs> the sky was somehow yellower now. They ought to get on with it. Better to rip off the band-aid, you know? Is it? I wonder if your friend will feel the same way. She stopped. What's that supposed to mean? What do you know about her? About why she is the way she is? She felt suddenly exposed in the street, in her outrageous dress and her unmasked face, so she ducked into a naked sidewalk before proceeding. It was a natural born or in type blue, literally a whiz kid. The recitation came easily. She typed enough clinical variations on it and its assessments over the years. Father said his stomach gunk, mother was the at the hand before she turned foundation mage. Magic rubbed off in the womb. The air here smelled different, a sort of sulfur-tinged cinnamon. If her parents hadn't been researchers, she would have ended up in a box. The voice laughed, a deeply dishonest burst of mirth. She might end up there yet, it sneered, when the truth out. What truth? She snapped, irritated at the, at her, irritated out of her caution. The gloved hand immediately closed her over her mouth, and another pulled her by the waist deeper into the shadows. She caught a glimpse of a long white beak and beady glass eyes before the last lingering light slipped away. The gelate waist. Oh, I guess a gelate waist. It was in one word, an octopus. One word was misleading, however. It was in actuality an eight story tall translucent octopus containing a seven story tall translucent octopus containing a six story tall translucent octopus, etc. Six of its tentacles dipped into the gelatin, and when they moved, the landscape dr si shifted dramatically. Two of them were free. They stretched away to practically infin 
to practical infinity. Something, presumably the octopus, suddenly spoke in a high and querulous voice. Who summoned me? Udo traced a glance with her father, lying beside her in the bed of jail. She crossed her legs. Uh, my name is Udo. This is her, my dad. This felt somehow insufficient. His name is Obi, so not quite enough. Hello? Hello! It shrugged back. I am the... A bite liege, eh? You have to judge of the Malaskari, the Prince of Suck, Uncan and Epus. My true name is Dip Dip Dip. May have you ever heard it spoken? Who <sighs> reckon she heard that less than three different Separate toddlers speak the name of the prince of second FS on at least three different occasions. She also reckoned it unwise to say so. I come from a wretched and benighted realm, she said and said, where even the light of one so immensely immense as yourself cannot reach. If she'd been saying of, she might have urged though she didn't trust the length of her lab coat. She just smiled them earlier as she attempted to stand up, plunging one arm into the sparkling surface. The octopus thing clapped the butts of two of its super tentacles excitedly. Oh wow! That was great! We did the fancy speech thing! I've always wanted to do the fancy speech thing. Her smile became manic as she jumped to her, her feet. Yeah, that was neat. Very Ben Johnson. She helped her father up. Ben who? The sprinter? I don't get the reference. Her cheeks hurt now. No, uh, the playwright. Spelled differently. She blinked. Okay, are we cool, you and me and him? She made a complex you and me and him gesture as if it would help. Lord, don't let that be a spell. Yeah, of course we're cool. This guy's a precise... As Ephelopod is smiling to one side. Why wouldn't we be cool? Udo shrugged and looked at her father again. He shrugged. It's a giant octopus thing, right? Right, of course it is. Several of the interior octopus octopi grew noticeably smaller than noticeably larger. She wondered if they were breathing and if they were really an it. She decided not to think about it. The b was still talking. Wolf down for Corbenic. You'll know you're not cool with someone when they straight up murder you. After life, I, I was with near its regeneration are great for people being very honest and explicit with their feelings. Hmm. I defer to throw out her, her brow. Not sure I like to test that regeneration during, you know, the death of magic. Oh, do they have that where you're from? I was gonna say, if you don't, give it a pass. It's been playing merry hell with my sinuses. Your sinuses, I repeated. Yeah, it used to be a thermotarctic membrane keeping all the gel from going up my nose when I breathe. Part of the whole, uh, sure, we branched you to underground for a fortnight, but we're not trying to actually torture you, Delio. It all looked down at the gel. She could swear she saw the reflected silhouette of the kangaroo running downward in the depths. You are banished? Why? Don't remember. Somehow the giant octopus gave the vague impression of a shrug. But of a, a bit of interpantonic intrigue. Bit of extra having have your avatar suck it out and wear out. Somebody gets sent to the jelly waste to ruminate on his or her failure. A voice yawned somehow in their minds. <sighs> I wonder if the term's up yet. You hear from those Lunar Dawn guys recently? Udo's eyes, eyes widened. Lunar Dawn? You in the Three Moons Initiative? 
Damon and called that for... She frowned. For like, forever. Oh, longer than a fortnight. Yes, Obi said, longer than a fortnight. Well, that's bullshit! The ground quaked as the angry octopus thrashed helplessly. I thought for sure they remember after a 15th at the latest. I have a mind to go give them a what for in their sky fortress. Griggled back and forth and the jail tried to in vain to free its remaining six legs. Might take me a century or two, mind you. Let me place a hand on his daughter's shoulder. I know someone who can help with that. She said, you do? Beggar is full of fire. The fuck are you doing here? Even that as referred actions to words as a rule, but she had to admit these particular words produced a striking effect. Her attacker retreated deeper into the gloom and cocked his head to one side in distinctly bird like fashion. This was considerably facilitated by the a long beaked mask scaring its face. Which might very well be its face. Are we acquainted? The tone was thin and then strident. Creature was swallowed in robes of every possible color, and possibly a few impossible ones. I heard your reckon in the street. It is you were not a local and thought prudent to warn you that you walk in a plague zone. She sorted. Sure, I'm gonna trust you about plagues. I bet you've got a ear that's most effective too. The creature squawked in protest, recoiling, raising one limp wrist hand in front of its face. The hand was mottled and rough. From where, might I inquire, did you collect that vile turn of phrase? Reconsidering her initial assumptions, even as replied carefully, We've had experience with someone like you where I'm from. Where you're from? No, I think not. Long face waggled back and forth emphatically. Not very much, not very like me at all. If talking, if we're talk talking of the same individual, I deeply regret your misfortune. That one arose from and occupies a place of great dishonor. We did not speak of him. It lowers its hands and drew itself up to its full height, easily towering over her from less than six feet off the ground. I am Ickes, the wayward. Words of Colmanus, scholar from beyond, pursuer of mysteries and wonder. I meant, trapped in his gold cage by the great dispersal. She nodded, the impasse. The impasse, yes, I thought your aura seemed familiar. The want Unsman gr gently grasped her shoulders with its talons. We have more pressing business as to attend to in the here and now, however. I do not know why you came to this place, but you, if your goal is a palace, your way is twice shut by the yellow and red lords. Oh well. Even as any lip of the ever skin at the return of the black lacquered voice. Guess we'll have to murder them. It gets fish a second, small beaked mask of its robe and crashed one talent deep inside. There was a spark a sudden spark and a rush of incense. The way forward is coated in miasma a uh, uh, most foul. If we are to progress, you will need this. It passed the mask to her and cocked his head again. Should make you less obtrusive. In the bargain, one should not go adorn it in al lest one draw attention. <sighs> it was hard to contradict anything but the ironically sickly sweet scent as she head back onto the street. The wands men close behind her. Uh, there was indeed a thin yellow mist on the cobbles, wit ending in, in and out of sewer grates, carved with scenes of or glass of chaos moving jerkily or frozen like a flock of fornicating deer in a full convoy of headlights. Through splintered doors and shattered windows and into the gaping mouths of masquerades gasping on the ground. Hunched figures in black robes moved door to door, knocking, waving wrought iron censers and further deepening the Isaac's mist. Their masks were golden, their eyes, their expressions gleeful. What are they doing? One of the others met with the pale, frightened face of a man wearing half a shattered cat mask, drew him out onto the sidewalk and pressed the sensor to his face. It chuckled over the sizzling flesh, the sizzling of his flesh as he breathed deep, began shivering, fell to his knees with a sickling crack of bone, and sort of tired fanery. 
This is the lament of the Yellow Lord. He has decreed that if death is to come to Alagada, it will remain on his terms only. The terms of the three Lords, he and his dissonance, therefore grace the Reaper with, the no with their noxious fumes. He always did know how to clear a room. He just flicked its gaze to her. There's something about your aura, little one. I thought you liked of, uh, of the foundation, yet there is a distinctly again aspect to you now and then. He can hear you. No response. She shrugged. Where are we going? The street was sloping downward now, and the structure herself with it, so that she could see a massive jet rotunda in a circular plaza ahead. Mist was, th was thick as there. Flung out in great, gaudy plumes, whipped by the wind that roared from the heights. To the Odeon. Get your late waste again. Oh no, it's not the main flying castle city thing. Who knows where that is? I'm just gonna call him the octopus with his tentacles vaguely. The economy is kind of special. It's where they hide the huge space portal thing. They stood out of privacy abyss before the abyss was up into Swallow's white lord. A rain of teal progressed downward into Unfendi. Udo said her father, who wouldn't meet her eyes. Tell me what I am. It's like a giant clam, they rambled. Only instead of curl inside, it's got a trillion, 30 trillion and a drill at sphere to matter or transfer inside. Clay Clams don't have those, I'm pretty sure. Wait, do clams even have pearls? Or is that oysters? Owie's face was pained. You know what you are. A child of magic. The top half is full of corp- and the ends, or whatever we call us, and the bottom half is full of moon people. They really miss the moon, so the space between them is charged with moon missing and non-moon missing in equal quantity. It rolled its recursive eyes in a spiral. That's how you get moon portals. She felt her cheeks flushing. I'm a child of Obi and Angelio Cori, as far as I know, and that doesn't explain why I can do magic with my bare fucking hands. Don't mind me, just expositing over here. His eyes were swimming now. Do we have to do this right this minute? Who knows when our friend will come back out? Eventually. The voice in her head was faint, but not faint enough by half. She ignored it. I do need to know, Dad, and I'm tired of waiting. He blinked away the tears. What? She stuck her hands in her lap coat's pocket to find either trembling. I've always known something was wrong. Something was off. Your story doesn't add up. Else Reinders was exposed to more esoteric junk than both of, of you combined. And she is and an, an some human goddamn unicorn. Tell me the truth right now, or we might as well wait for the man and white to catch up. I was hoping to see your I was hoping to see your face when he tells you. I reached down and plucked a handful of gel from the ground, barely sagging him so as he straightened. Your mother was a hell of a couch for the foundation. But not quite as much as she was for me. His mouth sadly flickered at just a glistening little sphere into the general jail fall. She was a hand librarian, familiar with some tiny, immeasurable, small percentage of the library's collection. That is to say, she knew more about somatic than we even knew existed. Squeezed one the nodule between his thumb and forefinger as if trying to make it worse. She even knew something of the Athenia. And with severed tongues, how to get there, what we might find. The library of Alagada, Un O grimaced. A safer one, rather. Not safe, not that safe as it happened. Oh, we let at the last of the spheres roll off his fingertips into the emptiness. We were engaged to be married when I went through the Ujana's gate with my armed escort. She had to stay behind. They didn't trust her yet. They trusted me. She trusted me. He shook his head. They were wrong, all of them. They usually are. We emerged in the Athenaeum. I think all God knows what you want. Where he needs to take you. 
maybe it just knows where y'all do the most harm, or the most harm will come to you. In any case, I was anxious for my prize, a buck whose name I honestly can't remember now. When I saw her, he swallowed. I saw her, and I was ruined. Careless and profligate, man in microcosm. Her voice was getting closer. They needed to move. She couldn't open her mouth. She was short, about as tall as even as. Smooth, dark skin, long curled black hair, amber, amber eyes. He looked into her as for a moment. I could see him behind the mask, a mesmerizing tigress with an alabastrian face. He shook his head and shut his eyes. I never found a book. They pulled me out there three days later. Me and my whip, men and women, all of us spent and wasted and, and stuck raving mad. Angie, when it came to my senses, I told her everything. He opened his eyes again, gazing into their depths. She was so clinical about it. She told me what that place did to the mind, to the body, to the soul. She told me she'd known on intellectually that something like it could happen, might happen. Was likely to happen, but she hoped it wouldn't. He seemed to lose an inch in height, deflating with each sharp breath. Honey, I, ever, I only saw the other woman one more time. And she came to our home in Sheffield and delivered you to me. The truth catches up with us all, given time. Udo didn't feel like screaming. She didn't feel like weeping or welling or gnashing her teeth. Mostly, she felt tired, so she didn't strike out and she didn't and shout. She instead placed a hand on her father's shoulder and asked, What was she, Dad? He turned her to face her. <sighs> Eyes lowered and unfocused. Ella got in. I don't know more than that. She... I don't know. She gave him a moment, but all I could manage was a sad sounding sound. She squeezed his shoulders. As he had done for her earlier, and then at three tears, she hadn't realized she'd been crying. A demon by any other name. The Odeon. Ica is declined to enter the theater, promising instead to watch her back. Even as was amenable, the rampant Arts of the Odeon were festooned with the same gold masked figures they'd seen prowling the streets. As many and as ominous as the crows in the hanging tree. She didn't fancy being one of clothes. The broad oak doors were unlocked and opened wide. Which is good because I'm not ready to go home just yet. The encircling foyer, a beyond on the void of both life and smog. Her heeled boots dug into the, into the rich saffron carpet. Rich emitted had small clouds of yellow. The fire in her mask still burned. And the incense reflected the dusk which reassur with reassuring efficacy. There were arches and copolas and lunettes and oreos and a cacophony of ar ar architectural styles. Row after row of soaring columns. She followed them up, up, up. Before forcing her eyes back down, she realized there was no end point to the vertical space. This whole city is a trap. Mind your step, mouse. She reached for her service weapon and she crossed the hall and all to the next set of open and doors. There was an inscription over the lintel in a language she didn't... A language she couldn't... True art is suffering. The Algon script melted into Latin and English for her eyes. And she grimaced. They'd have an easier time to find what isn't a cognito hazard here. If you're worried about the save of your mind, you came to the wrong city state. There was a tremendous autonomous crash and then another. And then an only technically musical pattering of notes and frantic discord. She walked in. The theater what her space was a cavern of dark stained wood and yellow curtains moldering with black. No, with black, my bad. She had expected it to be empty, but it wasn't. Nearly every seat was filled. Hundreds, no thousands of Alagod and stared transfixed at the performer. Their eye and mouth holes clotted up with bile, pus, and blood. Many of them were unmoving. Many more were shuddering and coughing, sneezing, and weeping. 
Golden Mask attendants walk the aisles, attentively pressing the uncontrolled matter back into the masks to litany of strangled or protests. Fuck. Stay, and you're no doubt appreciative hand. And applause is forbid. Applause is forbidden in Alagada. The yellow carpet was virtually spotless and produced no miss. The air in the theater was instead filled with raucous, unmusic pouring from a tremendous black piano on the stage, where a figure in flax and robes hovered madly at the keys. She couldn't see its hands, but its robe was bunched up where they should be, slamming into the piano's fists or picking out the anti-melody with modified fingertips. Do you believe in the virology of ideas, Chief a Ibanez? She walked down the central aisle, passing one of these lists it's the assistants. It leered at her invitingly. If you're talking about uh, memetics, I know enough to get by. The yellow lord's laughter was strained, unhinged. <laughs> there was poison in the world before the first word, but the first word heralded, heralded the poisoner's golden age. The music was now threatening at every turn to become tuneful, to resolve into something with meaning. But at the cost of sense, it pulled a rug out from under its unwilling audience over and over again. Even as was getting a headache. Do you know what Gogata means? It means don't quit your day job. She was halfway to the stage. It means cranium. Skull if you like. Can you feel the crucifixion nails in your brain, mouse? Can you sense the betrayal of your senses? In one practice effortless moment, ocean. She drew her service weapon and fired three times. The bullet struck in the sound on board, treble and bass strings, and the music died in a burst of splitting wire. The bearer of the odious mat looked up at her appraisingly. I didn't know you played. Enough with the bullshit. Crowd was staring now, choking and pulling at their masks and calling at their eyes. Give me your key. Again, that demanded laughter. Ah, <laughs> I already gave it to you. Could you not feel it worming around in the, your gray matter? Unlocking the recesses of your... Nope. She hopped up onto the stage, nearly eating a ridiculous as in the process. No more metaphors. Back on her feet. No more scary stories. Give me the key. The literal piece of metal that fits into a literal lock. And I won't have to cancel your perverted recital. The Yellow Lord drifted back away from the piano and rose beneath the Aphrosinium art. Of a resemblance to resemble a rigid bone, covered in sores and pustules. No music and no words. What's your poison, then? Cocked its head to one side, looking less like a bird and more like a cat. Aha! I have settled on boils. Its black eyes narrowed, or perhaps boiling. My mercurial mood does not settle long. She shrugged. Do your worst. Disease is meaningless where I come from. Are you touched? You spent too much time in Algada. The demented tone was tinged with doubt. Disease is a language universal. She sat down on the piano stool and leaned back, elbows on the keys. They clanged in protest. You've been trapped here a long time. I guess you don't know. My earth is gripped by a disease that never ends. It eats us away, day by day, and we don't care. We go about our business. We don't worry about getting sick, and we don't worry about getting other people sick. We pretend like it isn't happening because we're bored with it. It's just no fun, you know. The robe figure waved, uh, wavered in the air. This is a theater of music, it protested. If it's comedy you want, try the Argonium or the Globe. She chuckled. Oh, the Globe is right. A global pandemic, and we just can't be bothered to give a shit. 
not about ourselves, we know we're invincible, not about others, because they're not us. The Z's hold so meaning and when you're touching the head like we are. She leaned forward, hands on the bench between her legs. We once imagined a world without the Z's, and you know what? We could have had it. But we found something better, she smiled. We found apathy. Words are like a virus, friend. Yellow Lord shuddered, looking around frantically for the voice of the leaden tones. They get inside and eat you up. A thick black ooze, ooze poured out the yellow, yellow Lord's eyes and mouth. As Rictus reversed it to get off of horrified realization as it plummeted to the stage. Struck the boards like a burlap sack full of rotten produce. Its brilliant robes stained to evil. You work slow, she remarked. Rot is a process, not an event. She stood up, kicked the bench aside, and picked the piano notes one by one. Plink, 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 click. She stopped, armed one leg off the bench, held high over the head, and brought down on the dead key hard. In a scattered mass of black and white, she saw a glint of metal. One down. <sighs> Idra late waste. Do you really think you can do this? She can, Obi said. I don't know, Udo sighed. Of course you don't. She set her jaw. It's getting closer, so I have to try. She reached up with her right hand and traced the sigil in the air. She could see a faint triangular outline of sparks. She slapped her, her left pointer finger across it and it sharply. There was a rush of wind, a scattering of gel balls, and a pleasant whooshing beneath her lab coat. That's it, her father whispered. Now she drew a ring around the giant octopus. Then a series of jacket lines beneath a other bifurcated circle. There was a rumbling deep in the earth, and the octopus began to rise. I have never flown before! The octopus snapped its beak with pleasure. I am unlicensed! I think the air traffic controllers had bigger fish to fry today. She glanced at the light of, of the comedy on the horizon and the black gloom enveloping it. For returning to her work, a circle with spokes, like a wheel, two arrows pointing up, one pointing down. A series of crosses, row on row. She was now standing in a dazzling, platinum and light. A veritable outfit of al alchemy shivering down above the reflective field. And this octopus was torn from his wrist in a jelly with a tremendous suckling sound. Um, his tentacles broke the surface of the waste as far are reaching mountain ranges burst into temporary being. Udo and her father retreated from the new waterfall of greenish blue matter, watching as the miles long tentacles snapped free and glistened in the moonlight. I feel like a touch of fur, Ermin Anent. The octopus was spinning in the sky, tearing itself looser by a second as it rose. To the three moons, Udo! To the comedy instead, if you would. Her arms were over her head now, and she marveled with ease at the ease with which she held the idea of Honest God aloft. Oh, yes! The black slitted eyes peered down at her. Allow me to bridge the gap! It dropped its four tentacles, snapping its a scenery flat. At. Udo took her father's hand and stepped onto the rubber he surface as the octopus reached for the far flung star. So I was holding, even without her concentration. Shouldn't even begin to comprehend what she had done. Even closer, where Lord chanted, was only upon them now, to the final revelations. The Sanguine Quarter. Akis took its leave at the villain's gate, and Ibanez returned the mask. I appreciate the assist. The wandsman shuddered like a parrot checking out its feathers. The same to you, I may yet to save these blighted souls with their persecutor absent. Do you think he'll stay that way long? I shook its head. I do not know. I could feel the mystic arts returning day by day. But it matters not. There is time enough to do right. Right now. And I must set to it. A pause. If you mean to confront the lore of this place, whoever and whatever that presently may be, 
I would give one final a warning. I'm open. I once had the misfortune to attend a par performance of the Hink 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 King's tragedy. I'm cursed to remember each word that was spoken. I feel these in particular might serve to, to guard you for the struggle else ahead. The ambassador. He is our liege, but liege is greater still. Recite beneath our feet and along to sup. One royal heart emboldened by the lie that there exists a thing we call free will. The king. You might be driven there, there with one clap, so test me and decline shut your trap. I'll open mine. She frowned but nodded anyway. Alright, I'll keep that in mind. I would, and take care, Def Elfina Ibanez, but you leave this place better than when you found it. Not a high bar to clear, I know, but, perf but perhaps more difficult than you imagine. She shook its clawed hand. Though the skin was like sandpaper, the grip was gentle and walked through the open portal. Optimistic idiot, the voice sang in cheerfully. The coward speaks! The streets here were, were paved with gold, the ruby windows set in garnet and frames. The banner is bold and printed with love vicious, with, with la, uh, assist vicious scenes. Perhaps I just don't like doctors. I've had several decades worse of bad experience, you know. You gave as good as you got, I hear. The sanguine corridor seemed abandoned. Its door is shut. Its gutters and soups empty at the grooming, at the groaning half corpses, half, half corpses littering the rest of the city. Where is everyone? Inside. Inside what? You'll see. Central Bell Boulevard led to a mammoth structure of gilded black wood, the heart of a plaza with countless other streets running to and fro. It looked for all the world like a brothel. Shut up, she said out loud. I was only going to say you're well dressed for the occasion. The heirs of Corbenic. It was a staggeringly beautiful view. They were staggering because of the rough, uneven surface of the octopus god's tentacles that bridged the distant bastion in the sky. It was beautiful because they could see it all. All of Corbenic stretched out before them as a pl flat hate lane of gorgeous nonsense. While high I, apes wielding in, in snaps like agmites or impossibly tall tree trunks as clubs, a mountain piercing the clouds like an angry fist, a throbbing sea of gunk and gristle ebbing into an almost motionless gray-green river, a colossal stone cube surrounded by a mass of indistinguishable human figures cavorting obscenely with one another. Never made a lick of sense, and Udo desperately wanted to know more about it. But you are the student today, the White Lord reminded her, and a student doesn't choose the lessons. I was following them with ease, lighting along the endless cellophane in him, untroubled by his suckers or his syrupy skin, deliberate and inexorable. How did you get here? She said I had the courage to ask again, just the fact that he'd brushed across her side and it was enough to fill her, her with dread. Ovia Cory regarded his daughter with obvious misgivings. We have ways and means. You know I can't tell you everything. There was a tremendous burst of displaced air, and they nearly fell from their high perch. Two polished metal shapes blew past them, aircraft bristling with high-tech weaponry. Brilliant blue lanterns hung in from their tessellated cockpits. They were built in the image of anglerfish, she realized. She helped her father to his feet again, then prodded him in the chest. We're in what you might call a strenuous situation, Dad. A little clarity would go a long way. How far you have come. Your chalky stalker was only a few hundred meters away, and yet still unprepared. Ovi seemed to reach a decision. We don't have only one way of reaching Corbenic. It's not terrific. They call it Procedure 42 Humbaba, and it involves putting perfectly e e healthy people into comas. She stared at him. You let them put you in a coma at your age? He shook his head. I asked them to do it. 
Nobody else could be be sure of meeting you in the desert. Corbana has a way of making you face the things that you've done, who you are, the mistakes you've made. I haven't told you something and you deserve to hear. And let me tell you that you need... And then let me tell you what you need to know. She started out at the front eye, biting her lip. <sighs> we have MTFs over here, but no contact with them. There's a phone app, if you can believe it, but you didn't take a phone to Alagada. His tone was light, and he was obviously fishing for a smile. He decided, she decided not to give him one. It's the only way you get home, Wonderkind. And that's all that matters to me. The end can unbear a holes for the whole damn foundation as long as I know that you and your mother are safe. She finally spared him a glance and half a smile. Don't take any more risks, my dad. That's life. And maybe I'll forgive you. He winced. No more risks, I promise. They passed the remaining miles in silence. The far flung pinprick becoming a towering two toned Mr. Sandow flung into the sky, listening crazily to one side as a, as the mass of black, which was part and parcel to the hang of the hang king, strangled it. The angular fish craft was pelting the cloud with barrage after barrage of rainbow hued light. Blasting it away and the suffering it returned like pebbles dropped in a deep, dark ocean. Perhaps one more, he muttered. The Rubicon. The inlaid April door was mostly ajar, which was good. She wrestled on it the rest of the way open and was rewarded with a rush of thin red liquid. It trickled down the marble steps to pull around her stitched leather boots. Her first thought was that it was blood. Her second thought was more sensible. At the taps again, I see. There was a stirring in the candlelit murk. Cross the threshold. A burst of liquid levaciously commanded. And shut the door, you're letting Otto Claret out. She walked into the brothel and obliged enough to stop the flow of a not enough to trigger out a goddess ejector seat when she eventually left. The floor was paneled with red wood, the whitest board she'd ever seen. As though the better part of California had been chopped down to finish this tremendous, this single tremendous space. There was a polished bar as long as, as her as long as her gaze could travel, functionally endless like the columns in the Odeon. There were hundreds of upright tables, hundreds more upside down. And on top of them were flag and some wine dark floor. Shower glass and porcelain everywhere, sky barrels and tablecloths and chairs. Ceiling was a mirror of the floor, minus a, a, a rack. Although even and as the thought occurred to her, she watched her single male fork fall down to splash in the oil of plum. Gravity is such a bitch. The telepathic drunkard actually hiccuped in her ear. Serves us, ri us right for walking on the ceilings, I suppose. The Red Lord was seated across the boundless saloon at a large round table with a stained red cloth, a veritable mountain of varnished barrels. All of them slowly leaking were piled up behind it. Its grinning mask beamed blaringly at her as she approached. Have you come for the fun? I wish you'd come earlier. Ren's ink blot eyes up and down her dress, nodding and shaking of Uval. Oh yes, I wish you had come earlier. Drinking alone, she affected a haughty pose, hand on hips. Right, a leg struck provocably out of the obscene dress. Her mind in the end was a tactical one. Hardly suits your reputation. The Red Lord laughed in her face, a rather in her head, a deep and throaty bang like a hound in desperate heat. You're a delectable little ball of curves and muscle, aren't you? Well, maybe I should let, let you take that pent up energy out on me. It's possible we'd both enjoy it. A growl and the image of a hungry wolf all lit fight in her mind's eye. It's possible only I would, but that's a risk I'm usually willing to take. She flipped over and up in a chair, tossed away the wine-soaked cushion, cushion, and sat down. I'm very particular who I party with. 
and waved its sleeves dismissively. The Jubilee is ended in Algada Morsel, and the cross realms of men and madness both. And pause. What are you anyhow? You look human, but then I'm seeing devil. She shook her head. It's flustered. If he didn't have a key, he wouldn't even need to roll. We wouldn't even, he, we wouldn't even need to roll this asshole. And Red Lord's grin widened dangerously. We? Who is we? Mess squinted. My memory is not what once was. Thankfully, but I remember humans are a no as a non plural form of life. Sure, I'm human. She returned to live it. Less vicious. Las Vias grin. I hate that word. How about you? Where it counts. That uproarious, untrustworthy laughter leaked out again. I have my weaknesses, if that's what you mean. Wine, women, song. Its eyes flickered scarlet just for a moment. Have you been to the Odium? I had tickets, but... But then I also had standards. She laughed and it wasn't entirely in affectation. Have to hear it. Do those standards extend to your cellar? She pointed out the barrel fall. I wouldn't mind a drink, assuming that's wine and not blood. The Red Lord shrugged, locking a pair of flagons off the floor and staggering to its invisible feet. It's wine, it's Lord. But that doesn't mean it isn't also blood. I mean, I have heard stories about blood, about uh, the blood of somebody being wine. Or wine being their blood, I don't remember. She rolled her shoulders as it poured it out a copious quantity. Where do you find enough? It smirked. Ear to bloodless ear. Enough rubedo. Come now, surely you already have the answer. The barrel, she suddenly realized, were much larger than it needed to be. The silence of the streets outside oppressed her with her, her ugly import. She swallowed and stood up. I don't suppose you have anything in here which start out life on a vine? The Red Lord shrugged and dropped the second mug to the sopping voids. I run an equitable establishment. There should be weaker spirits in stock for weaker spirits like yours. She found a black bottle with white and stenciling behind the bar. That's how Lafitte. 1787. You weren't joking. Not always, but often. When she returned to the table, the Lord was already hunched over its mug. She sat down again and ripped off the top of the bottle. To your health? Hardly, it glared at her. You want something. Whoever you are, and I'm not giving, and I'm not the giving sort. I take, you see. I take, and I take that which is not offered, most of all. It leaned back, and she could see the leathery darkness beneath its robes, expanding and contracting with rapid breath. What do you want from me, you umbilic beauty? And what do you fear to lose? It clasped its robe of hands around its drink. She lifted the ball to her lips. I want your key. She said and took a swig. She was surprised and relieved to find a bottle of red wine contained, in fact, red wine. Give me that and you can take what you want after you drink. She wrapped her lips off on her dress sleeve. The Lord was virtually vibrating in its seat as it placed its flag on to its staring great even lips. We are going to adore you. Its eyes burned and wine red as it downed the rib at all in one gulp. You are not going to enjoy it. Poor stupid root, Udi. The Red Lord froze its loathsome and murmur swelled. You've sunk to the occasion magnificently, haven't you? Sagged to its feet, looking down her, her with a cup. Unflex makes a back to motion. Oh, oh, I see the bill has come due at last. Pushed past her, nearly upsetting the table in its haste. My cue to leave. 
Always the last to quit the party, old friend. The Red Lord stumbled, slipped into the rose, rosette and plachette, and looked back at her with an expression of confused terror. It's by nature, it gasped, for its orifices ran black and it fell forward into the wasted drink. He keeps his key in the till, the cruel voice yawned. Drunks are so predictable. You could have told me that at the start, she grasped and had in for the fire again. Saved me a bit of tension. Tension? Nah, there was nothing gr anything to it. The guild register did indeed conceal a right rusted key. Slaughter into wine and back again. Basic as alchemy gets. <sighs> the, blo the blockade at the breach. Middle's mind boggled. The scene around the fortress in the permanent was as far removed from the stark nothingness below as could be practically imagined. A polyglot array of impossible vessels, sleek designs of colorful metal kept aloft by repulsor, is glowing with the heat of at least several suns. Unfathomably vast capital ships looking like something out of Star Wars or the bastard child of a bark model collector's bit. Its box, and so many smaller fighter, smaller fighter craft of a dozen different descriptions that merely is trying to keep track of their movements and sent her spiraling into the distant sands. Like the great desert before it, the octopus is a seemingly in interminable but tentacle finally terminated. The minimum stranded high. In the sky with a view to end all views. Dichotomies often offer two soaring skylines. One stretching toward the trio of moons and the other hanging over the waste like a melted cake. The upper hull was orange and the lower hull was blue. Wrapped around a central cavity lambent with radiated white. The light however was dying as a sentient charcoal nebula roared through the immense luminous spires, enveloping them, pulling them down and apart, or sending arrestating spiderweb cracks through their trunks. There was a constant musical tone, like the shattering of wine glasses and every science fiction and laser sound effect you'd ever heard, plus several old novel ones, rang out as the three moons initiative tried in vain to pierce the hangman's shroud. She almost fancied that as she could see him sang in the glow and gloom of the Citadel's core, drawing down the artificial sun. A sight to die for, don't you think? Your father certainly did. The White Lord was still approaching at a leisurely, at a leisurely gate, and they were still or at the end of the road. She was about to suggest that they love taking them across the gap when a sudden explosion of concentrated sound heralded the arrival of a polished chrome carrier, which hovered at the tentacle sip and did the long unlanding wrap into its flesh with the wet of the wrap. A lone dark woman in simple military dress strode down to meet them, and for one horrible moment of narrative auspiciousness, Udo thought she was going to meet her mother. The woman was too tall, her eyes too dark, and her expression too displeased for that to be the case. She stuck out a hand and Udo took it without thinking. This is your fault, the woman declared, jerking her three her free eight thumb over her shoulder. Thanks so much. Yeah, well I don't know how scientific your spaceships are, but if they're even a little bit magic, they're only flying because of me. The woman suddenly smiled, a gesture at least partially predatory. Hell of a thing to, cre to take credit for. The foundation kills magic stone dead. You d, d it back slows molasses that I'm supposed to be thankful? No thanks. She backed back. She backed back up the ramp. Anyway, the impenetrable thinks you might be useful. So I should um, you indeed that comedy if I found if I somehow found your way if you somehow found your way here. Didn't think there was much chance of that, I'll admit. She shook her head, resting 
one hand on a telescoping but not sure I want to risk getting close to that thing. Not a word I use slightly in Corbenic, just to watch another cat's paw get eaten. Your father's sacrifice for not. Udo shut the voice out. We risked a lot to get here. We can help. We don't then expect a burst of harsh laughter. <laughs> Risk? More like sacrifice. You might have walked in on your own two feet, lady, but your friend clearly came feet first. Udo suddenly felt weightless. A lot of doubts she'd suffered in the past few hours, days, weeks? Bring up the oxygen in her brain. She looked at her father, who looked back at her with an expression of calm resignation. The other woman raised an arm, pointed a finger in the air. My work here is done. She dropped her arm, and a battery of guns pelted the White Lord with a full with a fusillade of rippling fire. The mask and empty rope dropped up off the, off the tentacle like a stone on a feather, side by side. Get on board, the woman snapped. Let's see if you're worth the ammo. The Phlegmatic Quarter Unlocking the Israel's gate was a simple matter, and the final stretch of the city between them and the palace was as even pal brighter than the last. Here, the streets were clean, the sumptuous apartments free-flowing in, in fluids. The layout, simple and direct, too direct. Every line seemed to terminate before its time. Every angle was too acute. Even as felt a panic coming on. As she made her way towards the black stronghold, squatting severely on the horizon. The Algodans in this order walked through the streets in silent procession, marching in neat rows from one end to the other. Heads bowed, breathing labored, they parted around her as she moved. She fell like a trout swimming upstream. I remember the parade, the voice mused. The joy in the eyes of the assembled old throng, their hopeful faces exposed to the heavens, the madness in their twisted smiles, the march of their naked feet upon the corpses of their betters. Yeah, sounds like a real Mardi Gras. They found me like a pack of ravening animals. It was thoughtful, almost reverential. Bred to docility, but spurred to violence by fears and hatreds, which could not subside, but only fester and grow. They ground me to dust amongst the cobble I had laid, laid in the knowledge I would one day be ground up against them. Okay, that's a little weird, even by your standards. You have never ruled a city, pleb. You have never known what it is to own the lives of men, to warp their minds, to boil away their pretenses and accretions and their hollow projections of what they want to be. Until the rotten core of what they truly irrevocably are is all that remains, and a knowledge that won't be enough, that they will not be able to handle the revelation of themselves, that they will rise up in anger and tear you down. You have never given anyone a gift such as that. I think you have n ever known true love, Delphina Ivanez. She could see the final get ahead. It was already yawning open to accept them. These people killed you because you were horrible, and you feel nostalgic about that? You die, you, you deny yourself so many pleasures when you have lived as I have. So long and so fully, you cultivate more sensitive tastes. There is nothing sweeter in all the world than knowing that knowing you have laid the groundwork for cruel, vicious, bloody revenge on the ones you have led to wrong you. Alright, well, that's a lot. You're a... A lot. I smiled as I dashed my faceless massage against the stone, only to tread my innards through the streets of Algada that... That was... Because I could already taste their eviscera in my mouth, hear their cries for mercy in my ears, feel the raising wrath in my bosom as I pronounced them doomed and damned. Oh, yes. 
I have aged my anticipation to fine vintage, and today I will drink deeply of the sorrow of my friends. They walk beneath the tyrant's gate and into the shadows of the hanged king's home. The comedy. I will break the fulcrum of war. Old oh, sees rolling in Atchmond hollowed in the heart of sparkling Sida as Uda and her father slid a mile away on the burnished teal surface, watching it. I will sit in the throne, but flit between the cracks. He's chatty, Uda remarked. She was barely able to choke the words out. Her levity had no lift in the airless space around the hanged king's wrath. He spent who knows how long he's chained to a chair. Her father, now dressed in three moons military attire, gazed at the chaos with obvious wonder. Lightning flashed in the inky cloud, illuminating the multiversal aperture which Dicomedy had been built to produce. Udo fancied each she could see the stars and perhaps the surface of the moon. Funny Ian flickering instance. You'd be chatty too. <sighs> she looked up at the far our hole. The two halves of the fortress were not connected. The aperture ring flowing between them on the strength of the metaphysical surface tension and alone. She could see orange robed monks standing on the bottom of the orange half. On the ceiling of her perspective, all of them were staring into the court or of the hanged, hanged king's mouse drawing. Their counterparts in blue stood in a circle around the or portal, similarly captivated. Two small cities were of living atomic anchors, all enraptured by the specter of death as it beat fruitlessly at the, the door dimension, between dimensions. I will not be denied! A spray of fume in the shape of, of a tremendous clawed hand swat at a pair of passing Ing interceptors, clipped their wings right off, they cartwheeled through the darkening sky, disappearing before the, below the artificial horizon. I am myself! Denial and finality! The Three Moons fleet was still pelting the cloud with its esoteric arsenal, but the battle seemed hopeless. Tendrils of rippling in Pisius flesh tore through windows, doors, and walls, probing, searching for something to soothe the once man presumably raging at their source. A peace being you'll be the first to fall. Resist and I will show what I have learned of suffering since ages before your worlds glimmered in creation's light in creation's eye. Udo sat down on the riveted surface of the flying fortress. I don't know what I'm supposed to do about this. There's an unchained god tearing reality apart, and I'm just a demon spawn with no underwear. Her father sat down beside her. You've never been just anything, Udo. I don't need me to tell you that. You're stronger than anyone I've ever known. And you're good. You think we're Vanek bends over back backwards to help just anybody? The flying bear walked out of the broken cave for you. They don't do that. A god crawled out of its tomb for you. An ex foundation three moons general just gave you the time of day. Game recognizes this game, Ludo. Clapped her on the shoulder. You owe me the challenge. You know you will. So what's the matter? Her eyes were blurred with tears again. You know damn well what the matter is, she whispered. And I heard the voice of the White Lord once more over the din of the Hang King's Fury. Follow the thread, unravel it, pull it taut, and measure it end to end. Know the awful extent of what you lose. She shook her head. She shook her head. She obviously wanted to say something, but had no more words to speak. She finally spoke her, spoke for him. Hambaba. She'd grown up in, in the copious library of Site 91. She knew the the epic of Gilgamesh off by hell. I remember Hambaba. When he looks at someone, it is the look of death. They always... Damn. She rubbed her eyes vigorously and they came wet. It wet. They could never resist putting clues in the euphemisms, can they? Everyone dies, Udo. She stared at him. In our beds, in our cars, in hospitals, or the shower, or the side of the road, everyone dies. It usually doesn't mean a goddamn thing. We die alone. Our minds lost. 
Our loved ones far away, even if they're right beside us. He reached out to take her hand in his. I had a choice. Of, I had a chance for something better, something nobler. I could speak to you. I could tell you what I told you. I could even spend one final day beside you. If that wasn't a good enough death, Wonderkind, what kind of life must I have led? She was tired, so very tired. In a way, Corbenic's energizing magic couldn't touch. She wanted to tell him that. She wanted him to make it okay. She stood up, pulled him into a rough embrace, and said instead, Wait here for me. This isn't goodbye. Then she released him, painted the air with a complex digital dance, and strode into the impenetrable thunderhead. The Palace of Alagada. The halls were empty of life, and her footsteps rang and hollow on pitted stones. The echoes didn't travel far, swat down by the oppressive gloom which gl which cloaked each iron ancient. The rows of blank, moth-eaten banners and the yawning arches to empty rooms. The Palace of Alagada was a monument to a monarch who had failed, and then fallen, then fled. And the dying people who had once been straws now shunned these collapsing corridors. He is still here. She stopped, barely keeping herself from crashing down defensively. Who? Me. The repulsive murmur wormed its way into her skull, and this time she nearly dropped her knees on a sudden burst of pain. You crawl back to my tomb, deserter. Once you had the e sense to run. She popped as two tremendous iron doors. Wrought with whispering sigils and legions of faceless soldiers. She could feel their non existent eyes upon her. <sighs> As she crossed into the throne room, she had been here before, and she had not. There were two Alagadas, one dim and one dark, un umbilically connected by a pit of rot in the shape of a dead god at the core of the palace. The empty throne was covered not in rusted trains or spikes of blood, but simply the dust of long centuries of neglect. The shadows were merely shadows, not the unnatural extensions of an unnaturally extended, unliving beast that called itself a king. A staggering, stumbling shape emerged from those shadows. She didn't like the way it moved. She drew a weapon. The curse flows through the space between spaces. The shape was bundled in white bandages, black skin peeking between the creases. Permanent and never meant alike, a glow and with sullen light. Life returns to the dead city, breath by breath. I really hoped you were dead, she said. She checked the safe safety, mentally counted the rounds, knowing none of it really mattered. I was, and am, and always shall be. Oops. A brave shaft of grey light trimming down from the from the lunette in the throne room ceiling illuminated by the ambassador of Alagada. And she realized why it was moving so erratically. Its head was still twisted it, it round, and it was walking backwards. I have a gift for you. She reached across her, her chest for the bag, whipping slightly at the feel of her skin on the central matter of the dress. A tribute to the new king of Ar of nowhere. The ambassador didn't laugh, but did wheeze as it jerkily closed the distance. I'll take everything you have, assassin, and then I will take you. It looked her up and down with its its blank, black face. As she heard the bones crack in its shattered neck. Fire weapon. Spend the opportunity. You will not see another. One is plenty, she said, pulling the payload out of the your bag and stuffing off a, a single shot as the high heel of the ambassador's right boot shattered and it lurched forward in surprise. She tore the bandages off its head and slammed SCP-35 or the empty, trivelling visage. Swallow my tears for or ten thousand years, the Yamak made monster blubbering in her, her mind. And to glow hours suddenly twisted into an ear erectus. Perhaps even eleven, perhaps eleven thousand. Dichotomy. 
I will cross the divide again of my own unbroken will. The hanged king's hoarse voice deafened her as she approached the nexus of turning limbs. My chains are broken, my fetters shattered, and I am no slave. And this is what you're doing with it? Smoke parted, and a hovering figure in rotted black robes appeared before the flickering ar aperture. I was torn from my home, from my people, from my very body, it hissed. I will have that which was stolen from me, and all the earth beside. Living your best half-life, huh? The horror drifted closer, and she saw its ragged face. Clawed massive scars and boils and burns and bleeding and gashes. A mass of twisting, of twitching feelers like maggots crawling beneath cadaverous skin. A mask, a face, no mask in creation could hide. All that power, all that strength, to even be able to form a complete sentence after what you've been through. You must have an iron trap for a mind. And yet you're stuck in a single moment. I am free! Two plumes of smog swat out of the holes of, of the camp uh, out to me. A third reached out from the king's chest towards her. I will wreak freedom across the lands I have lost! She crossed a circle in the air, and the grasping smoke burst mere inches from her. Do you really not grasp why the architecture won't change for you? Why you can't make it show you anything but static? She glanced out at the e inverted crowd. You know it isn't them doing it. I can see you've sunk your hooks in. They're focused on the earth like they've never focused before. And yet the doors are still will not open it. Why is that? The Hanging King's voice was like a buzzing of cicadas in her mind. She wished above all else that would break the monotony of laughter or song or anything but that endless drone of despair. The king of Algarra does not answer to you, witchling. Rather, all eternity will answer for my suffering, and this obstruction only piles up higher. She shook her head, amazed at the serenity which had settled over her. She was talking to the hanged king. The hanged king! It somehow didn't matter. Your suffering, sure. Do not mock me! You know nothing of my torment! A teacher from a foreign land has shown me with an aeon's tender affliction the limits of flesh and spirit. It caressed the empty air in front of her. They tore me from the drowned fatness of my sobbing, vault of iron, and ran through me with a cruel lance of hope. I danced at the end of, of a chain for them, and gained only an understanding. There is no love, there is no life, there is only the breaking, the creativity of uncreation. She scoffed. You sat in darkness for how long, and this is your fallout move, raging in the light, but still going nowhere? Her braid have withered under an assault of human entity as the king King's wrath boiled over. I am going everywhere. Every corner of every earth will know what it is to be silent, be still, be static in the face of change. I will walk among them, and I will laugh. She laughed her fat herself, and the effect was marvelous. The black villain back against the portal. Oh, and the wretched, unhappy thing in forever seemed to wither for the, the space between in few seconds. Change? What the hell do you know about change? You fucked up. You fucked up bad enough for your entire city. Ruined all their lives. Damned their souls. Tried the humanity out of... Of Lord knows how many people who loved and trusted your sorry ass. And then what? Not a damn thing since time immemorial. You talk about your pool of tears, they've gone stagnant. Your high and lowness, and you're still dry outing in them. She pointed at the aperture. That's why you're going nowhere, or don't you get it? There's no tension within you. You're still chained to that throne. You're still in Alagata, and you're never going to leave. You have no hopes, no dreams, no soul. You're just a dead husk. With a C-shaped accretion of hate built up around you. There's nowhere to go for you. But back in the cage. I will not return to Alagada. The darkness pressed her back. Shoving her roughly to the seal. And her glasses fell from her face. There's nothing there. It is finished. It is the past and I am the future. You're a broken thing. She gasped. And you're fleeing the things that broke you. All your power. 
all your strength, and you're using it to lie to yourself, to hide from the horrors that, that even you fear. She had her, her hands in front of her face, carving her venerable zodiac in front of her despair, a few final moments from the rushing tide. The lords of Algodon have fallen. Your city is waiting for you. I spit on my city. It offers me nothing. She hoped against all hope, against the turbid warning that hope was futile, which closed in around her from all directions, that the answer which she had to give was correct. It offers you closure, she whispered. Liar! The white lord stood on the edge of the cup. Ah, to me. A science fiction battle raging behind its villain cloak. Its thin mouth twisting into an almost mirthful grimace. The Henki Inga stared it down this out across the steel plain. They were the sound like the rustling of dead leaves, a band portal. Forgotten, Udo crawled to the aperture. Palace of Alagata. She should have opened it by now. Something must be wrong. Everything is wrong where the master is concerned. Maybe I should cut my losses. The Black Lord sneered at Ibanez. It had a warning strike into expression since taking full possession of the ambassador. Maybe I should cut you. She stuck her, her tongue out. Call me back when you're not moonwalking everywhere. With a sickening crunch, the mass head swiveled around and the Black Lord popped its neck experimentally. You really did a, a number on this body. Your so is in fine shape. A corridor of gray sparks ruptured the murk, and a wall of static the size of a swimming pool burst into existence behind the, the throne. The static resolved into a nonsensical image. A tunnel of orange and blue, black smog and a green sky, two row figures approaching one another, and a haggard vision of Udo Okori. Help, she said. The cut out to me. Turncoat! The Hank King seed, motes of acid black pouring from its robes to sizzle on the other. Her whole. Pay your obeisance. Your obeisance. The white lord was indomitable. I come with good tidings. I come with the news that you are no longer needed. The dead god spot at in a swarm of dusky hornets. They watched over the, the white lord, which did not fit an as its edges as the edges of its rose began to fray. I will return you to dust. Questling, and the wind may take you. Obi Akori sailed back into the crowd of blue robed monks, watching as the dimensional aperture dissolved into stag again. He watched his daughter approaching confrontation. I am the wind, the white lord howled. I am the breath of chance, slow and deliberate, the rush of knowing, the wheel that turns. It spread its arms wide. Your gestation ends today. Today, you truly are a god. Take up your mantle in the stars. Spread your will across the cosmos. Tarry not in Alagada. The Hang King swiped at the air, and a fist of gaseous slate knocked the specter er, at the deck plates. Does this end? I am not the crutchless fool who dined on Hemlock in the Feast of Words. You have no truth for me, and never. It suddenly fell past where its nature had been, and briefly. First, as the more shall be for reforming and at, at breathless kneel. What is this? Doubt. The right lord rotated back to an, an upright position and loomed over its former liege. The warlock girl has crippled you with her petri with her perfidy and deceit. Destroy her and leave the dead to the crows. The crossroads of the universe stands before you. Choose a new path. The king was wreathed in ash and cinders, obscuring the portal from the right lord's view. It hammered at the fundament end of the atomy. Its fists exploded into dust over and over and over again. You cut me, and you bleed me, and you cut at me, and you bled me. The voice was thin and reedy. The resolve was spent. I bleed. I bleed. Then bleed. The White Lord rasped, and with this, your blood, is it the Hing King's? 
It overflowing with goblet of viscous black into its face. The White Lord shrieked and tore at its eyes with sleeves now stained with, with pitch. It howled and raged and crashed the deck as Hang King and rose again. It turned its nightmare face upon her and asked, Why? She shrugged. Because the choice wasn't his. And it isn't mine. It's yours. She gestured back at the aperture, which still showed the silent throne of Alagada. Your servants await you. A second chance. Is that what you want? Ovi emerged from the crowd, headed for the convulsing shape of the transfigured white lord. He picked up speed and kicked, and the mask skittered across the riveted surface of the Atomy. He tore the rope from its back and left it shuddering in a pool of spreading ichor. The Hang King then plucked the mask from the desk plates and then fixed its gaze on Udo. The faithful exiles return? She nodded. Then I will go to Alagada and see what changes I might make. Cloud of ash obscured its loathsome face and glided toward the aperture. I have finished with you, warlock. She didn't see it move through the portal. She only saw her father standing before her, holding the soiled white robes, eyes shining. Told you, he said. She made a noise between, uh, halfway between joy and despair, a loud, ungracious burst of emotions. I opened it, she said. I opened the goddamn thing in myself. He smiled. Of course you did. The way you've changed, the things you've changed. You're twice as a spirit that an empty husk could ever be. You know who you are, Udo. You're not lying to yourself, and I'm not lying to you either. Not anymore. He shook out the impossibly bright fur ever uttering the decks ex with flanks of gunk. But that's not the only reason it opened for you. You're torn between two places, like those monks above and below. You want to go with your friend. You want to stay here with me. You can do both, you know. I know, she whispered. You have to go. I know. You have to go now, while you're still unsure, while you still don't want to, or the gate will close. He handed her, her the robe and pulled her into a, kind, into a rough embrace. He held each other tightly, if we're not nearly long enough. Go home, Wunderkind. That's German for Wonder Child, by the way. Not sure if you knew. Which is kind of a loose translation to Prodigy. At least, that's how I understand it from um, Persona 5's quest, um, quizzes. He wrapped the shroud around her and she understood. Living matter couldn't pass through the veil around the Corbenic. Just like the Goblet of Black, blood, uh, the wrappings of the White Lord exceeded on a previous shield of unlife. This then was goodbye. He walked her to the portal and smiled in the face of her, her tears. Will you be okay? It was a stupid question, but she had to ask. She had to hear him lie to her. If only one more time, she hoped he wouldn't mind. He laughed. <laughs> you found me in the desert and you brought me to the end. That's the hard part over. Palace of Alagada. The aperture remained open, and as Udo dropped the filthy robe on the filthy floor and braced her fit, and her father watched for a moment, then turned and walked away. Stupid plan, it was soft. Stupid, stupid plan. Was that your dad? Even as I didn't know what else to say. Why? Why? It was shook her head. Not now. We don't have, have time. Oh, you knew. I was hoping to surprise you. The Black Lord stood beside the throne where the Hang King was slumped, unresponsive. A myriad of tiny, faceless creatures were pulling chains and slinged ropes across his oceanless body. Dimensional travel is so very draining. My leech lord needs his rest. Udo sneered as they approached the eyes. I thought you were the faithful one. Tragic mask affected a look of wounded dignity. I am! I am! They would have let him rot for e all eternity. I only plan to take the lead for, or shall we say, an aeon or two? Two quivering figures stepped into the light, sang beside the ambassador's stolen body. One in red, the other in yellow. 
Their masks were caked in uh, opaque ectoplasm. We're on the same page now. Let's do some exploring. And I do fall hungry. Really. Well, you're welcome, even as kicked out the grind. I'm on the floor, exposing cracks in the mortar. Don't call us, yada yada. What would I need to call you? A tragic scowl returned. You're not going anywhere. I could see the aperture, little crowd. Sucking her hands into her, her pockets. Don't test me. I have worn enough mortals to know better. You would lose so much if you shut the door. You would never be able to open it again. That which is dead. Everything dies. Go fuck yourself. That's not very poetic, even as Chet I did. I think you mean shut your trap. The Black Lord lunged, and Udo chucked two fistfuls of Corbenic sand into its oily face. The aperture er snapped shut, even as clapped her hands, and the door and the floor were under centuries of dust and dry tears dropped beneath them, and they fell into another world. Theirs. Black Lord wiped its face clean, then inflicted a, a mass of bitumen and his sand into the, onto the walls. Oh well, bravo. Foundation Mission Control. Any change? The lead ground controller smiled. 179 is pointing out a potential impact near Mars now, and 2578D is gone. Dr. Richard Barnard it's my back at him. Guess they've got bigger fascists to fry. The Strated Admirador. The Royal Astronomer nodded at the palpably excited behind her hollowed hawk mask. That's right. She didn't really shut it. She just moved it to the sky. Take a look. She stepped back from the ornate black telescope and frowned thoughtfully. Ah, can you actually? Let's find out. The Black Lord pressed its mask to the eyepiece and grunted with pleasure at what it apparently saw. The after to Corbenic, sizzling in the yellow sky, promising the eminent conquest of a thousand and unwitting worlds. That she knew who was there, the astronomer or could see with her almost naked eye, and the possibilities had the wheels in her mind spinning over time. Wait, there's something else. A moment's pause. Do you know that code with the flashing lights? As it happened, she did. The complete obscene of heavenly bodies in Neverment had given her no end of time to spend on other esoteric subjects. The Black Lord recited what it saw, and when it was done, the astronomer recited the message back. Change your ways, this is a warning shot. A beam of intense energy arced from the ar aperture, which vanished at the instant before a glowing red hole was punched through the, the Black Lord's forehead. It fell to the observatory tiles, being black blood and melted of porcelain, gurgling softly. Without being sure why, as she did, the astronomer knelt over the eyepiece again. There are more flashes. She's picked up a draw from a nearby desk and undoubtedly transcribed them. Consider yourselves warned. We still have more. We have one more story. Okay, yeah, so this is the same thing. <sighs> He's hoping this is the last one. And that's way shorter. That's what I'm really hoping for here. I wasn't expecting that to be longer than yesterday's. Wow. Threshold. Sure do you love when things take forever to load. <sighs> Hang on. Okay, we're back. <sighs> it's our long read. Let's get it out in. So like this is gonna be a four hour long video. 
Actually, I don't think I can do a four hour long video, so this is going to have to be the end. Okay, this that's the end for today, and tomorrow we'll read that and finally end this. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. We'll finish SCP-6500 tomorrow, so until then, goodbye.